Friday. Let's make a start. Then I, I did go to the wrong room, but uh, I am here now. So, oh. agenda item one is a, a appointment of the chairperson. I'm Councillor Steve Hunt, leader of Neath Talbot Council, and I will be chairing today's meeting of cabinet. So, agenda item two is chair's announcements. So, can I welcome members of the public or press viewing this meeting? Can I please ensure that your microphones are switched off? You are here to observe the meeting only. Members and officers, please ensure that your phones are switched to silent for the duration of the meeting and that your microphones are switched to mute unless you are speaking. In addition, when asked to raise your hand, if members who are virtually attending the meeting could raise your electronic hands, and for the members uh, in the chamber, please raise your physical hands. Agenda item three is declarations of interest. Can I ask members, any members, if they have any declarations of interest? And please would members say what the items are and what the interest is. And if you do have any, Tammy will forward you an electronic version of the form for you to complete and email back. Councillor uh, Nia Jenkins. Nia. Yeah. Thank you, Chair. Uh, yes, declaration of eight, I, um, on item eight. I'm a member of Keeley Council. Thanks, Nia. Any further indications? I see no more, Chair. Thank you, Tammy. Okay, agenda item four are the minutes of the previous meeting of Cabinet held on the 11th of September 2024. The minutes of the 11th of September are on pages 5 to 14 of your agenda pack. And the minutes are year for approval of accuracy. Do members have any comments on the accuracy of these minutes? No? Then, the, sorry. The, uh, Nicola needs to declare an interest. Okay, Nicola, if we go back to your declaration of interest then, please. My apologies, Leader. I should have dec declared an interest in relation to the Freeport uh, report because I'm the company director and therefore I will not be able to take part in any discussions. Thanks, Nicola. That's noted. Mike? Yeah. OK, so members, do you have any comments on the minutes? Don't see any, so I'm happy to propose that they are a true record. Uh, can I have a seconder, please? Happy to see you, Luke, David, please. Thank you, Alan. Members, if you do not indicate to the contrary by raising your hand, I will assume that you're in your content with the accuracy of those minutes. Dami, can you confirm, please? Yes, I see no indications to the contrary, so those minutes have been approved. Thank you, Tammy. Agenda item five is the forward work programme for 2024-2025. The forward work pro programme is on pages 15 to 28 and is year for noting. Agenda item six is public question time. I have received no notifications this afternoon from the public to speak at today's meeting. Agenda item seven is the 2025-2026 Budget Progress Report. The report is on pages 29 to 48 and is here for a decision. And I would like to call in our Chief Executive, Karen Jones, to add anything further, please. Uh, thank you, Chair. Obviously, we brought um, um, an Outlook report to Council back in July, where we were painting a picture then of a very challenging budget context for 25-2026. And we drew attention at that time to a statement that the then um, Cabinet Secretary for Finance and the Welsh Government had made, which was indicating that there would be no cash increase to the Council's budget um, for the next financial year. And of course, since then, we've got a new government in the Westminster Parliament and we're not hearing anything yet that would indicate that the budget position is going to improve in terms of the overall amount of money that's likely to be available so we are estimating a £23 million gap for next year. That's largely driven, as members know, by increases in demand across care, across education and across housing, and then compounded by the fact that goods and services are costing more money because of inflation, energy and the things that are also affecting household um, um, budgets. So if I may just ask the Director of Finance just to summarise what the um, information is before the members this afternoon and kind of next steps and what we're asking for in terms of the decisions from the Cabinet this afternoon. Yeah, thank you very much, Chief Executive. So you've just um, introduced the report, which is what I was going to plan to do myself, so I won't repeat what you've said. 
Um, just to move on in terms of that budget gap position, um, over the last four months, the corporate leadership team, so that's the chief executive, directors, myself, heads of service, have been looking at proposals to, to look to see how we can close that gap. Um, within the report, you will see in Appendix 2, there's a schedule of proposals which total um, £11.8 million, which is where we've got to to date. Um, and even after that, this still leaves us a £9 million plus um, big problem to solve going forward. So, so the purpose of bringing these proposals forward today, Chair, is to ask for Cabinet permission um, to go out and enter into an early engagement, really, with staff, communities and partners to test these proposals before we come back um, in front of the Cabinet in December with more formal proposals to consult on. So um, that's it for me, Chair. Do you Thank you. Thank you uh, both Cara and Anne Hill for explaining that. Can I ask Cabinet members if they have any questions? Alan? Yeah, just just oh, I d I don't know whether Councillor Noyle wanted to come in, did he? Um I'll go to Councillor Noyle first. I've yes. been as a okay, cabinet member for the portfolio. Uh over to you, Simon. Thank you, uh, Chair, and um Theol Carlin for allowing me to come in first there. Um I'd just like to thank Karen, who and all of the corporate directors and all of the teams that have worked very hard on this over the last couple of months. Um apologies I can't be in the chamber with you here today to um to say that in person. Um, but I think it's important to realise um, the the amount of work, the hard work that's gone into to get into where we are today, and, and it doesn't stop there. Um, we still have that budget gap um, that we still have to um, plug. We have to find other items. We have to wait to see what the settlement figure that comes from Welsh government is. In terms of the list of items, um, as we've obviously we've seen these in in various meetings very recently, um, your member seminar earlier this week um, was one of those. Um, the list of items has now been sent to everybody. I'll also be writing to the chairs and vice chairs of all of the scrutiny committee meetings. I'm hoping to get that out either this afternoon or tomorrow morning um, to write to the scrutiny committees so that they go through each of the line items in each of the scrutiny committees um, and come back with suggestions, observations, proposals, recommendations or any alternatives um, that they may wish to put forward. Um, but it's like I said about the um, pension credit, I think last week it's a good start, but we we need to keep going because we we haven't we haven't balanced this budget yet. So um, a lot of hard work to do between now and March of next year. But um, once again, just to say that I'm entirely grateful to everybody that's been involved in the process to date. Thank you very much, Chair. Thank you, Simon. All in. Uh, I, I, I won't repeat everything that Simon's uh, already said, ob obviously, because the report that's in front of us and uh, its implications are, are very stark and, and very clear. And I think that was taken on board by members at uh, at our meeting on, on, on Monday, uh, where all elected members uh, were able to see to see the figures. And I think that the message that we clearly have to uh, make to governments at all level, whether that's Welsh Government or United Kingdom Government, um, is that without additional investment in public services, um, we will be seeing the loss of services and potentially the loss of jobs, not just here in East Patalabot, but across all local authorities uh, in, in, in Wales. Um, and we already know, of course, about the critical situation facing several local authorities in England um, all, already, uh, where some uh, local councils are facing bankruptcy and all that means in terms of the services that can be provided in communities. I think it's important for all of our communities to understand uh, the situation because, um, as as said in the in the in the introductory remarks today um all our staff teams have been working incredibly hard to try to identify savings and ways of continuing services uh, there's been tremendous participation uh, by our employees uh, the unions the heads of services and of course the directors that are with us in the uh, in the chamber today um, so I think we need to take every opportunity to get these crucial messages across to decision makers at Welsh Government and uh, UK Government um, and we will be reaching out to all our residents and all our communities uh, with this information but also to listen to ideas and priorities 
um, as we go through the next few difficult months in terms of the of the, of the budget process. Um, so again, we would appeal to all members, whether they're in the chamber with us today or, or not, to continue to participate uh, and to contribute ideas. Uh, Thank you, Alan. Thank you, Simon. I think you both have covered that off. I, just for me, very quickly, is that um, you're both right, of course, and uh, encouraging our members uh, uh, here in East Talbot, and we will uh, embark on uh, going out to our communities uh, in different consultation ways. Uh, and we are in uh, we encourage you to take part in this uh, because uh, the, the consequences of not balance of the budget or service cuts or, or job losses will have an effect overall. So we want to hear from you. If we've got alternatives of savings uh, and ideas, that, that's what we're going to carry out uh, to do during the consultation process. So I would encourage you all to do that. So thank you very much. I now refer members to the recommendation on page 36 of your agenda pack. I'm happy to propose this agenda right now. Can I have a second, please? Obviously, I do. Can I ask if there's any abstentions? Don't see any. Members, if you do not indicate to the contrary by raising your hand, I will assume that you're in favour of the recommendation. No indications to the contrary, Chair, so those recommendations have been approved. Thank you, Tammy. Agenda item eight is the Community Council's Minor Project Scheme application from Kilbebel... Nia was Nia. Can you say that word for me again? Killabebeth. So application from Killabebeth Community Council. The report is on pages 49 to 54 and is here for a decision. Can I ask Hugh if he has anything further to add, please? Uh, just to note, Leader, that this is an application for a £9,000 grant towards a £91,000 project for Killabebeth Community Council and meets the criteria for the scheme. So I'm recommending to members that it gets approved. Thank you. Thank you, Hugh. Members, do you have any questions? I don't see any. I now refer members to the recommendations on page 53 of the agenda pack. I will propose this agenda item. Can I have a second, please? Happy to see you look at it. Thank you. Alan, any abstentions? I don't see any. Members, if you do not indicate to the contrary by raising your hand, I will assume that you're in favour of the recommendations. No indications to the contrary, Chair, so those recommendations have been approved. Thank you, Tammy. I move you on now then to Agenda Item 9, which is the Neath Port Talbot Welsh Church Act Trust Fund. The report is on pages 55 to 60 and is here for a decision. Again, can I ask Hugh Jones if he has anything further to add? Please. Uh, no, nothing further this one, Chair. Thank you. The application meets the criteria, so I'm happy to recommend. Deal. Thank you, Hugh. Members, do you have any questions? Again, I don't see any. I now refer members to the recommendations on pages 57 of your agenda pack. I'm happy to propose this agenda item. Can I have a second, please? Alan? Sorry, uh, uh, yeah, happy to see you. Happy to second. Thank you. Any abstentions? No, I don't see any. Members, if you do not indicate to the contrary by raising your hand, I will assume that you're in favour of the recommendations. No indications to the contrary, Chair. Those recommendations have been approved. Thanks, Tammy. Agenda item 10 is the miscellaneous grant fund application. The report for this uh, application is on page 61 to 66 and is here for a decision. Who can I ask if you have anything further to add on this agenda item? Uh, just to say, Chair, this is this is a building that the council own leases out to the South Wales Miners Museum, and they therefore apply for a grant towards the cost of that rent to the value of ninety five percent. So it's in line with all sort of standard um, the arrangements, Chair. So I'm happy to recommend. Thank you. Thank you, Hugh. Members, do you have any questions? Don't see any. I now refer members to the recommendations on page 63 of your agenda pack. I will propose this agenda item. Can I have a second, please? Happy to see you, look at it. Thank you, Alan. Any abstentions from members? I don't see any. Members, if you do not indicate to the contrary by raising your hand, I will assume that you are in favour of the recommendations. No indications to the contrary, Chair, so that uh, miscellaneous grant fund application has been approved. Thanks, Tommy. Agenda item 11 is this Disabled Facilities Grant Options Appraisal. 
The report is on pages 67 to 97 and is here for a decision. Can I ask Shalee Howard if she has anything further to add on this agenda item, please? Thank you, Chair. So back in March this year, I presented a paper to the Social Services, Housing and Community Safety Cabinet Board highlighting the increased pressures and demands on the Disabled Facilities Grant budget. Essentially, there are two key issues we've identified that are impacting on the um, on the provision of DFGs. So firstly, the removal of the means test for small and medium works has resulted in a significant increase in demand. And then that's had a knock on impact for those who are most in need of a DFG and don't have the financial means to be able to purchase those works themselves because those people are now waiting much longer to be able to access a DFG and get the works they need. Secondly, officers have also identified that the rising costs of works means that some adaptations that people have been assessed by an OT is needing costs more than the £36,000 DFG grant limit which means, again, that those people who don't have the financial means to pay the difference between the actual costs of work they've been assessed as requiring and the DFG limit of £36,000 will go without some of the works they've been assessed as needing. So officers have spent some time looking at options to better manage these challenges and be able to try and help those most in need of a DFG get the adaptations they're assessed as requiring quicker. And that's why we're now putting forward two recommendations. The first recommendation is to give permission to officers to undertake a public consultation in respect of reinstating the means test for small and medium works. The second recommendation is that we put in place a discretionary budget of up to £100,000 per annum, which we can then use to allocate up to £10,000 per application as a discretionary fund for works that cost in excess of the £36,000 limit, like, ad, uh, like extensions. Thank you, Chair. Thanks, Shalee. Can I ask members if they have any questions? Uh, Councillor Llewellyn, please. Yeah, Dr. I'd just like to uh, thank Shalee and the team for the work that they've undertaken in developing these options um, and bringing uh, the information to members um, in, in very good time uh, so that we are aware of the issues. And I think the report illustrates the pressures that uh, have been placed on the service from the combination of limited resources and increased demand. Um, there was a, a very good um, scrutiny uh, session um, on, on this report a couple of weeks ago, um, which and, and the support shown by the scrutiny members, I think, illustrated the care that had been taken to make sure that the the outcomes that we are aiming for are as as fair um, as possible, uh, and ensure that we are helping those that are most in need um, of the um, having the grant to help uh, with the disabled facilities. So um, I'd be happy to support uh, at the right time, Chair, uh, that we um, accept the recommendation to go out to further consultation um, on the proposals. Just thank you, Alan. Any other member have any questions or comments? I don't see any. I now refer members to the recommendation on page 79 of your agenda pack. I am happy to propose this agenda item. Could I have a second, please? Happy to see you, pleased to support you. Thank you, Alan. Any abstentions? Don't see any. Members, if you do not indicate to the contrary by raising your hand, I will assume that you're in favour of the recommendations. No indications to the country leader, so that recommendation has been approved. Thank you, Tammy. Agenda item 12 is the consideration of the Draft Air Quality Action Plan 2024 to 2029 and the consultation procedures to be implemented. The report is on pages 99 to 192 and is here for a decision. Can I ask if Kerry Morris has anything further to add on? Nicola, you were taking this item this afternoon. So, uh, Nicola, is there anything further to add, please? 
Thank you, Chair. Um, just to add that generally air quality is moving in the right direction. Um, there's been significant improvements over the years. However, because of an exceedance that's uh, happened in one location within the existing air quality action plan, uh, we consider it prudent to continue to monitor that carefully and implement mit mitigation measures as identified in the action plan with partner organisations to ensure we um, we protect the residents from uh, air pollution as far as practicable. We're also mindful of the of the fact that there's going to be a lot of activity down in the air quality management area over the next few years associated with any decommissioning work that happens in the Tata plant and potentially um, subject to all approvals being uh, secured, any redevelopment and regeneration work in that area. So again, that's further justification for us to progress with this action plan and the associated consultation. Thank you, Leader. Thank you, Nicola. Do members have any questions on this agenda item? Because we all know air quality is so important to our county borough. Uh, I see Jeremy, Councillor Hurley, please. Uh, not a question, just a comment. Uh, I sat in on the uh, Clean Air Cross Party Group uh, this week, and they start a new scheme in November where schools will be um, asked if they want to join in, in an air monitoring um, sort of scheme. And, the, and Wales is underrepresented, it's underrepresented, so I'll pass that on to the Education Department and Environment as well, so perhaps we can take part in that as well. Thank you. Thank you for that, Jeremy. Any further questions? I now refer members to the recommendations on pages 102 and 103 of your agenda pack. I'm happy to propose this agenda item. Can I have a seconder, please? Thank you, Alan. Any abstentions from members? I don't see any. Members, if you do not indicate to the contrary by raising your hand, I will assume that you're in favour of the recommendations. No indications to the contrary, Chair, so those recommendations have been approved. Thank you, Tommy. Agenda item 13 is the direct payments policy. The report is on pages 193 to 254 and is here for a decision. Shalaya, do you have anything further to add? Chair, oh. Chair, can I take this one? Sorry. Sorry, who's that? It's me online, Andrew Jarrett, Chair. Oh, Andrew, sorry. Andrew? Yeah, um, I mean, this is a straightforward report, um, Chair. Uh, it will make changes that will prevent significant buildup of cash in clients' accounts, which would then need to be paid back to the local authority. So it's an administrative change, which will stop people having to pay back significant amounts of cash, which have built up in their in their personal accounts. Uh, so um, just commend this to, uh, to, to to Cabinet, Chair. Thank you, Andrew. Apologies for that. I, I don't know, Shalee, is there anything further to add? Nothing from me, thank you, Chair. Thank you. Members, do you have any questions? Don't see any. I now refer members to the recommendations on pages 197 to 198 of your agenda pack. I'm happy again to propose this agenda item. Can I have a second, please? Happy to see how you look at it. Thank you, Alan. Any abstentions from members? Don't see any. Members, if you do not indicate to the contrary by raising your hand, I will assume that you're in favour of the recommendations. No indications to the contrary, Chair. Those recommendations have been approved. Thank you, Tommy. Agenda item 14 is the Public Health Wales Act 2017 and special procedures in licensing. Uh, the report is on pages 255 to 264 and is here for a decision. I believe uh, we have Neil Chappell here to take this agenda item. So, Neil, do you have anything further to add, please? Thank you, Chair. In respect to this item, there is one small amendment that I'd like to make to the recommendation of paragraph 23. Yes. Shall I proceed? Yeah. Yeah, uh, please. Th thank you, Chair. Good afternoon, Cabinet. Um, after further legal interpretation of this new piece of legislation, we've identified three powers which are proposed to be delegated to officers uh, in addition to the one shown in paragraph 23. Uh, these are section 65.2 and section 66.3 and 6, which are powers to give notice that an application for a special procedure license is refused. And section 68, which is the power to give notice that a special procedure license is revoked. Members, all three of these powers contain an option for the applicant or the license holder to appeal that decision to the licensing committee. Therefore, it's proposed that these three powers 
be added to paragraph 23 at the recommendation. Thank you, Chair. Thank you, Neil. Before I get to the recommendation, which will include the, those three powers, can I just ask members if they have any questions on the report or uh, on the part that Neil have just uh, mentioned uh, this afternoon? Any member got any questions? No, I don't see any. OK, now I, I now refer members to the recommendation on page 261 of your agenda pack with the, the three added uh, uh, recommendations that Neil has put forward this afternoon. So everybody happy with those being included? I, I'm happy to propose it with, with, with the inclusions. Could I have a second, please? Obviously, you look at it. Thank you, Alan. Any abstentions from members? Don't see any. Members, if you do not indicate to the contrary by raising your hand, I will assume that you're in favour of the recommendations. No indications to the contrary, Chair, so those recommendations, as well as the verbal um, that was added by the officer, have been approved. Oh, thank you, Tammy. Agenda item 15 is the consultation on the 2026 review of the Senedd constituencies, uh, and these are initial proposals. The report is on pages 265 to 280 and is here for a decision. I will now bring in our Chief Executive, Karen Jones, to see if she has anything further to add. Thank you. Uh, thank you, uh, Leader. As you know, the um, Democracy and Boundary Commission, Cymru, had published their proposals almost um, just before the Council met at its last meeting. And there was a very short time uh, uh, time scale for responding to the initial um, proposals that they were making. I think we had four weeks in total to respond. So Council agreed that we would have a cross-party group that would come together to inform the Council's response, which had to be submitted before the Cabinet was due to meet. Um, so that response you've got um, in front of you today is the product of two meetings we had with the cross-party group the Council approved. And the report, um, the letter that's before you is for noting rather than for you to make a decision. If there are any questions on the response we've submitted, uh, Rhys George is on the call. And obviously uh, between the two of us, we're happy to help with any queries you may have. Thank you, Karen. Members, do you have any questions? don't see any. Can I just mention that this item is proposed for immediate implementation and will not be sub subject to the call-in process. Do I have the support of the relevant scrutiny chair, please? Sean, is that? Councillor Percy? Councillor Percy, are you there? He was vice chair. Apologies to interrupt there. Um, Councillor Percy must be having some sort of connectivity issues. We have spoken to Councillor Percy about this before the meeting. And he's given us his verbal agreement. Um, oh, and also an email my colleague is telling me. So you do have the support of the scrutiny chair. Can I ask Mike if that's acceptable, please? Yes, that will be sufficient, sir. Thank you. OK, then. I now refer members to the recommendations on pages 274 and 275 of the agenda pack. I will propose this agenda item. Can I have a second, please? Obviously, I look at it. Thank you, Alan. Any abstentions? I don't see any. Members, if you do not indicate to the contrary by raising your hand, I will assume that you're in favour of the recommendation. No indications to the contrary, Chair, so that uh, immediate implementation recommendation has been approved. Thanks, Tommy. Agenda item 16 is the Welsh in Education Strategic Plan 2022 to 2032. The report is on pages 281 to 416 and is here for monitoring. Uh, can I ask Andrew Thomas if he has anything further to add? Thank you, Chair. Uh, nothing from me, but I do have um, Kate Windsor-Brown on the call who would just like to take a very short few minutes 
to um, draw out some of the really successes from the um, the report before Cabinet consider the recommendations. Thank you, Chair. Thanks, Andrew. Kate, over to you then, please. Uh, thank you, Chair. Um, just to highlight that this report is the annual RESP evaluation for the year 2023 to 2024, and that this report is for monitoring only. Um, so it's been yet another successful year with many highlights, which include um, the production of some excellent promotional material, which include a set of videos that I've circulated to members in the next few weeks. They outline the journey through Welsh medium education from birth right through to adulthood. Um, also, the local authority has built a strong relationship with the National Centre for Learning Welsh and staff from our English medium schools have attended or are currently attending a variety of Welsh language courses and our aim is to roll these courses out throughout the local authority in the near future. Um, we've also developed Welsh medium childcare provision in a Skolgenbrag Trebanos, which opened this September and we're currently working on a provision in a Slivera Brodier on the north site. Um, as a result, by the end of the academic year, the aim is to have a Welsh medium or bilingual childcare provision either on site or close to all of our Welsh medium schools, and this should make then the transition easier for pupils and parents. Um, these are just a few of the developments, but the full WESP annual report has a detailed description of developments and successes throughout the year in all of the outcome areas. So I'm happy to take any questions. Thank you, Kate. Uh, very exciting times, isn't it? Can I ask members if they have any questions? Uh, Nia, please. Thank you, Chair. Uh, not so much a question. It's just to just to thank everybody. I know Kate actually lives and breathes the West Report, and she and the team have done amazing work here. It really is a good news story. It's quite innovative that Kevin Tyson are going to have this uh, cluster group of Welsh language, and I'm sure the in, the childcare provision will increase our numbers further, which is all good news. With the Eirfa Steddfod coming next year to Margam, thought I'd get that in now. Um, I look forward to further developing this and opening, hopefully opening another Welsh language medium school in um, over towards this area when a parcel of land is found. Thank you very much. Diolch, Kate. Yeah. Thanks, Nia. Any other members got any questions or, or comments? No? Uh, can I just reiterate what Nia has said and uh, take back to what uh, we know uh, how much Andrew, uh, Andrew Thomas and, and uh, Rihanna and you, Kate, and all those working in the educational uh, side of, of, of the uh, of this has done uh, to get us where we are. Just excellent work it is. And I have noticed that Councillor Hurley got his hand up as well. So, Jeremy, over to you. Again, uh, just a, another, not a question. Um, I was lucky enough to attend Van Gorthain for a week. Absolutely brilliant. And, and has helped me um, enhance my Welsh and also uh, passed on, you know, lots of good tips and things that we can probably spread in, spread in the community. So, if anybody gets a chance to go there, you know, take advantage of it. Thank you. That's all. Thanks, Jeremy. I know we speak on behalf of all of our council members, uh, so well done to everybody involved. Okay, then, as we said, uh, we note this monitoring report. So I'll move on to agenda item 17, which is the Strategic School Improvement Programme. Um, sorry. Uh, the report is on pages 417 to 452 and is here for a decision. Uh, I'd like to ask uh, Rihanna Crowhurst if she has anything further to add, please. No, nothing to add, really, other than to say this is just um, a request for approval to consult. And um, we'll be bringing, if, if it's approved today, we will bring another two reports after this um, around this this process so this isn't a one-off report if approval is granted today thank you thank you rihanna members any questions councillor uh, nia jenkins please thank you again chair um uh, while it's not being predetermined on this um it's just to add to it that additional learning needs and um, autistic spectrum demand in the county is increasing and by reviewing the provision in Comtawes School, it will 
probably have a positive impact on our valleys and communities because pupils will be able to access this within their own community schools, which is our aim to be inclusive. Thank you. Thank you, Rhiannon. Yeah, th thank you, Nia. Any further questions? I don't see any. I now refer members to the recommendations on pages 429 of your agenda pack. I will propose this agenda item. Can I have a second, please? Obviously, I look at it. Thank you, Alan. Any abstentions? I don't see any. Members, if you do not indicate to the contrary by raising your hand, I will assume that you're in favour of the recommendations. No indications to the contrary, Chair, so those recommendations have been approved. Thanks, Tommy. Agenda item 18 is a school-based counselling service update. The report is on pages 453 to 502 and is here for monitoring. Can I go back to Andrew Thomas to see if there's anything further to add, please? Just what I would like to say before I bring in Rhea Miller again, just to say um, she's the manager of the service, so just to say a couple of things about this, this service. Um, Mental health and well-being is a priority for the new education minister. So this is a really important service for us um, to assist and support our young people with um, with mental health. So Rian is here if, uh, if he's for leader for us to just take some short extracts from the report, if that's okay. Yeah, thank you, Andrew. Thank you. Yes. So ju just to say, as Andrew said, it's a really important statutory service, the school based counselling service. The School at School Based Counselling Service supports the emotional wellbeing of our children and young people across North Patalbet and now also our school staff as well. And we do this predominantly through one-to-one -one therapy and also supervision services for our school staff. Outcomes across all service areas are consistently excellent in terms of improvements in emotional wellbeing. Although we are experiencing some challenges in relation to waiting times due to the increase in need, which has risen considerably over the last four years. The school based counselling service works below the statutory age of year six, providing a primary school based child therapy service, service to years one to six. And this is very much valued by our, our families and schools. In addition, in light of the link between school staff and pupil well-being and in line with the whole school approach to emotional health and well-being, the SBCS supports our school staff via our supervision and counselling services. Both our primary school model and our school staff service model are very unusual across Wales. This practice is happening very sparingly and, and certainly not to the degree that it is an MPT. And the, therefore, these services are of great interest to our Cabinet Secretary for Education and Minister for Mental Health, both of whom are coming to visit with us in January to learn more about these service areas. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Rianne. Members, any questions? Councillor Leah Jenkins, please. Thank you, Chair. I feel as if I'm taking over this meeting. Um, I would just like to thank you, Zoe, Rianne and the whole team. This is a unique and innovative way that we're providing school counselling services here. As we said, for pupils year six and under, supporting parents and peer support. It's absolutely invaluable. I'd particularly like to thank the emergency care and provision that you've put in over the past year, where we've tragically had six critical incidents within our schools and the support you provide to parents, staff and the pupils is absolutely amazing. So it shows the importance of this. So thank you very much. Thank you. Thanks, Nia. Any further questions? Rianne, can I just ask one a co correlation between uh, the COVID? Uh, you know, uh, is it like the legacy of COVID, isn't it? We know it's still there, but uh, sometimes we forget it. Is there any evidence that uh, what the pandemic has, has created within the, the school uh, system, and I mean, I know it's, it's out there as well in, in our communities, but uh, mm -hmm. is there any evidence based on your knowledge and your expertise? Only one quick question from me, if you don't mind. Thank you. Not at all. 
So no direct evidence as such, but certainly anecdotally what our schools are telling us is that when children have returned to school after the pandemic and obviously in the years following, that they are noticing additional wellbeing needs in their children and young people. But also when we look at the school-based counselling data nationally, prior to the pandemic, family was always the highest predominant issue, highest presenting issue and predominant issue, and that was consistent for around 10 years. Following the pandemic, that changed to anxiety. So it would be reasonable to suggest that there is a link between that and COVID. Um, but there's no, I wouldn't say there's any concrete evidence as yet, but I'm sure that will come in the research to come in the next few years. Oh, thank you very much for that. Okay, this report is for noting, uh, for monitoring, sorry, it's a monitoring report. So I move on now to agenda item 19 which is the future provision of indoor leisure services. The report is on pages 467 to 502 and is here for a decision. Appendix B and C are private items and we'll need to go into private session if there are any questions on those appendices. Um, can I ask, have members got any questions on appendices B and C? Uh, and before other members answer, can I just bring in Councillor Ken Phillips on this agenda item first, please? Ken. Thank you, Chair. I'd just like to say a few brief words before we begin our consideration on this item. The decision before us today is not one that we would have wanted to be having to consider, given the previous decision made by Council to insource our indoor leisure services. Indeed, I know that we would have all hoped that we'd have been able to enact the previous decision before now, had the financial landscape been more favourable. It is, however, one I think that we have no choice but to think about very carefully, given the changes in our budget position since that previous decision was made. The budget settlements being handed down to us year on year by the Welsh Government at the moment simply do not cover our rising cost pressures, and with no indication of immediate improvement on that, we have no alternative but to consider difficult and unpalatable decisions across our council services in order to balance our budget as we need to do by law. I'd like to place on record my thanks to everyone involved in developing the options before us today, and especially to the trade union representatives for engaging positively with this process over the previous months through the working group as we sought to mitigate the costs of bringing the service in-house. We have three options before us in this report today. And I, of course, have made no decision yet and will be listening very carefully to the discussion and to questions and answers. In deciding between them, we must, I think, keep in our minds the need to protect jobs and services, as our administration has tried to do across the Council throughout these difficult budget years. And also, of course, to provide the best possible value for taxpayers' money. Thank you, Chair. Thank you, Ken. Andrew Thomas, I understand you wish to address members and following on from you will be our Chief Executive Karen Jones and Hugh Jones will also address members this afternoon. So, Andrew Thomas, over to you first, please. Yeah, thank you, Chair. And um, you know, just following on the, the heels of the comments of the portfolio holder there, I, I too share um, the sort of, I, well, I understand the disappointment of the members of staff within Celtic for um, the Council not enacting the decision taken some years ago. Um, but financially, unfortunately, we are where we are. And those decisions that have been taken thus far have been taken to protect services and to protect jobs. Recommendation two is quite clearly the officer recommendation. And again, the essence of that is to protect public services and to protect um, jobs both within Celtic Leisure and within the council. And those two things need to be remembered. This isn't just about the council, but this is about those staff in Celtic Leisure, because you know we believe as officers that recommend recommendation two is the most affordable. It represents the best value for money. Um, it provides Celtic um, protection in terms of how the contract is annually negotiated in that um, every year there's a mechanism where we look at inflationary increases, which is not something we've done in the past, which may have led to the position that Celtic found themselves in back in 2019 when they were having significant financial difficulties. Um, 
It also protects the council taxpayer referenced by the portfolio holder because it is value. It does represent value for money, and therefore it does protect the council taxpayer going forward. And it it also meets the requirements of a medium term financial plan because the, the outlook is not a pretty picture when you look at the financial situation the council finds itself within. But also, crucially, there's a million pounds investment fund included within the proposals um, uh, in, in option B. And if if invested wisely, and that will help to drive revenue streams, uh, which will make the business more sustainable, but it also will provide us with a platform to have conversations and dialogue with Celtic Board as a council with the Celtic Board and trade union representations to improve the terms and conditions of the staff, which obviously is something which the trade unions have been um, fighting for for a number of years now. And I have every sympathy with that perspective. But what we don't want to do is put further pressure on council budgets, which means there'll be further pressure on Celtic, which will inevitably have a def detrimental impact on jobs in Celtic, public services, and council taxpayers in East Talbot. So that's, uh, Chair, why uh, recommendation two is the officer's recommendation. Thank you, Andrew. And now bring in Karen George, our Chief Executive, please. Thank you, Chair. I've only got something very brief to say at this point. I may want to come back in uh, later on in the meeting, depending on how the debate goes. Um, I want to repeat what um, Andrew and what uh, Councillor uh, Phillips has already said. I think I just wanted to be clear that the decision the Cabinet had been asked to make this afternoon is about uh, whether they extend the contract for Celtic Leisure or pursue one of the other options that's available to them. So I think we do need to be really clear what the decision is based around this afternoon. There have been obviously a lot of representations um, on behalf of the staff of Celtic Leisure and understandably so that have come from trade unions um, up to fairly recently actually uh, before the meeting. So I think again is is really important to be clear the Celtic staff are not employees of the council, they're employees of the Celtic Leisure organisation and you've just um, confirmed Andrew that there will be a um, every opportunity to continue the conversation with the Board of Celtic Leisure, where I'm sure we'll be wanting to make sure that any representations that have been made to the Council about staff terms and conditions are shared with the Board. And we've got mechanisms within the proposal that's before members to enable us to work with the Board over time um, to try and um, advance those particular interests um, that clearly you feel strongly about and the trade unions have done a good job in bringing to your attention. But I did just want to be clear, the uh, decision before the Cabinet today is about the contract between the Council and Celtic Leisure and we have no locus here in the Council to be t determining those terms and conditions. That isn't what this report is dealing with. Thank you, Carla. Hugh? Please. Yep, thank you, Chair. Um, I just wanted to add some um, financial context really for members. Um, so since the decision was taken by the former administration back in February 2022, the financial position of the council has deteriorated significantly. Over the last two years, our costs have risen by £72 million, yet we've only received £27 million in funding from Welsh Government. This means we've had to close a £45 million gap through savings and council tax rises. Members will also know from the earlier discussion that we're facing a £23 million budget gap for next year and have only identified £11.8 million pounds of the savings to date. So we're significantly adrift in terms of where we need to be for next year. If I can be very clear, uh, members, if the de decision is taken to in-source, there is no funding available, so the cost will inevitably fall entirely on the taxpayer. And just a reminder that a 1% increase in council tax generates a net £750,000, so to fund £1.5 million would require a council tax increase of approximately 2% for every household across the county borough. So my advice, as it was back in 2022, is the cost of insourcing is unaffordable, and that's why we are recommending option two today to Cabinet. Thank you, Dioch. Thank you very much, Hugh. Before I go to members for their questions, can I remind members that if the questions that you were asking this afternoon are in relationship to Appendix B and C, we will need to go into private for those questions. So can I confirm with Cabinet colleagues that your questions that you're asking this afternoon do not fall in Appendix B and C 
for us to go into private. I see no indications that they are. Therefore, I will now go to members' questions this afternoon. Who would like to go first? Councillor Harris, please. Hi, thank you, Chair. Um, how is the contract extension proposed in option two different from the previous contract? And could it help prevent some of the issues that Celtic Leisure has suffered in the past? That's okay. No problem. Thank you, Leader. Um, Sorry, Chris. So, I mean, Andrew alluded to this to this earlier, but it's very much more of a partnership approach with um, uh, that's being proposed here with 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 Celtic Leisure. So, there'll be provisions in there for things like fluctuating utility, um, inflation. Obviously, that, that sort of goes both ways, um, and we've applied a sort of an efficiency um, to that that. Is similar to that that was going to like to be applied across internal council departments actually over the um over the sort of working up of the next mtfp so we've also added in the investment fund uh, again andrew alluded to that sort of that one million pounds that's made available over the over the five years um and the real sort of purpose of that is to to really drive help Celtic leisure drive those efficiencies reduce the costs improve income um that um make sure that our indoor leisure services are um, in a in a much stronger position going forward. I just had to add as well uh, that that sort of partnership approach is very much what's going on nationally as 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 um, a number of the you know the contracts come to an end post COVID and post the um, the cost of living changes. Okay, thank you. Thank you, Chris. All right, Sean. Uh, Councillor Hale, Joe. Thank you, Chair. Um... My question is, if the service were to be uh, brought in-house, as in uh, option one, could the additional 1.5 million costs be covered by just integrating the services more within the council? And also, would option two prevent us exploring options for integrating services anyway? Thank you. Thank you. So, um... I mean, this was something that was looked at very much in the in the in the working group, and actually, it was also discussed at, the, at scrutiny as well. So, um, we were the working group were really un, unable to identify any real significant quantifiable financial efficiencies in um, in, in 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 bringing the the um, the services in house and and making that gap of the one point five million. Um, it, we also think that that um, Celtic Leisure are able to undergo or under able to put together um, a lot of that work, take advantage, I suppose, is really what I'm trying to say, of any of those opportunities going forward and, and have done so quite successfully, actually, recently with things like the National Exercise Referral Scheme, um, where they've placed them within one of the sites and have had a... Um, uh, a real positive effect actually on that on on that program. So, really, what I'm trying to say is we will continue to work with Celtic Leisure through that through that period, and and any opportunities that come forward will will be firmly taken. Thanks, Chris. Okay, Joe. Yeah. Uh, Councillor Llewellyn, please. Just um, we 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 always have to consider value as well as cost when dealing with public money and public services. And the report says that option two is the cheapest uh, option, but would it also provide best value uh, for the next five years? Very good. Um, the, um, yeah, uh, the proposal to set option two will um, uh, provide a better value. Um, it is. It will. It's certainly the best value option that that is on the table at, at this moment in time. All right, Alan. Yeah, all questions will be to you, Chris. So I will just I'll call you in each time. May, may I just add to that? Sorry, may I just add Andrew? to that? Yeah. Yeah. I, th I think what Chris is is it's just sort of alluded to is it option two? We believe is certainly the best value on of the three on the table. The cheapest, and I'm not actually sure the report uses the term cheapest. I think it says financially advantageous, but um, the cheapest option would be to test the market again and go to the market. That would almost certainly, probably categorically, 
be the cheapest option to deliver leisure services. But, you know, as a cabinet, you've taken that off the table. So in terms of the best value for money of the three options on in this report, we believe option two represents the best value for money for the reasons I explained earlier in terms of council jobs, um, and protecting public services, the council taxpayer. Um, but it isn't the cheapest option, but it, option two is the best value option of the three, we believe, for the reasons explained. Just thank you for that, Andrew. Th thank you for that clarification as well, Andrew. All right, Councillor Llewellyn, yeah. Councillor Phillips. Thank you, Chair. Yeah, just to to pick up on, on something that uh, Andrew Thomas has said um, in terms of that other option of going out to market, I, I don't know that it was taken off the table by the Cabinet as such, so much as taken off the table by the timescales, given that the... Um, uh, that that we've had these two single year delays and that process would have taken 18 months to to complete i think i'm right in in saying that um uh, i do have a question um are the salaries currently within celtic leisure comparable with the kind of industry standard levels of other similar facilities in the area and noting what what has been said about uh obviously the staff being Celtic Leisure staff, not council staff, but does choosing option two prevent us from working with Celtic Leisure and the trade unions to try to help and encourage improvements in staff terms and conditions over the life of the contract? Thank you, Ken. So, Chris, over to you, and then, Andrew, if you want to come in on the first point, I'll come back to you. Chris? Yeah, thank you. Yes, um, the the working group did look, actually, that the, um, the comparable... Uh, salary rates for for a broad range of jobs across the leisure industry and they are broadly Celtic leisure's rates are very broadly comparable to the industry standard um in, in in the local area so from the other local contracts that are that are operating um and you know there's a commitment in the report but um there's definitely a commitment to carry on working with Celtic leisure and the trade unions to you know try and improve staff terms and conditions if if that should be affordable at any particular time. Thank you, Chair. Covered, was it? Yeah. Councillor Jenkins. Thank you, Chair. Just to summarise then, just so I get it clear in my head, I can fully understand why the trade unions are seeking enhanced terms and conditions there. But value for many ways for the taxpayer and for the service itself, officer's recommendation is that option two is uh, the better one there. Really, just the thing I was wondering, it's, it's like with option three, just recapping, as they are employees of Celtic Leisure, not technically Neath Patolba Council, we probably wouldn't be able to, we can influence, but we cannot dictate to Celtic Leisure that they change the terms and conditions of their employees anyway. Andrew, do you want to come back on that? Yeah, just not, not technically at all. We can't. <laughs> um, obviously, we can have conversations uh, and encourage, and we can even provide funding, which is what option three looks at. But in no way, shape or form, and you know, I think it's really important that members understand that, which is why I think Karen drew that distinction earlier. They're, they're not our employees, not technically not our employees. They're not our employees. Thank Andrew. Chris, I think Andrew covered that, yeah? May I just yeah. follow up as well? I know that we provide, uh, you know, leisure services. They're important for health and well-being in our community. And I know as a council, we do subsidise Celtic leisure. Can I just ask, will that be continuing, that we will be supporting leisure services for our communities? Should we go for option two as recommended? Very simple answer to that is yes, definitely. Um, if you want to do, if you wanted to look at the detail of that, we would have to go into private because it's contained within in the appendices. But but yeah, yeah. the appendices demonstrate how the um, annual management fee is calculated, and you'll see from that that there's there's a very significant subsidy, you know, and and the rationale for agreeing that annually with Celtic. Thank you. Don't need the details. I just needed confirmation. Thank you. Thanks for that, Andrew. That's what I said. Be mindful, uh, uh, cabinet members, about the uh, appendices A and B for private. Uh, try to steer away from that unless you obviously want to go into private. Uh, Councillor Noyle, please. 
Thank you, Chair. Um, yeah, just to pick up on um, <clears throat> some of the comments that Hugh made um, from a financial perspective. Obviously, I'm the um, Cabinet Member for Finance um, and Hugh's advice on that, obviously, I take very seriously. Um, what we've heard from you is that, and perhaps I can get a nod from you, um, Hugh, when I've said this, since the decision that was taken in early 2022, we've taken 45 million approximately out of the council's budget. Is that correct? Yeah, that's the figure I mentioned earlier, Councillor Nolte. Yeah, he's spot on. Yeah. So, you know, we, we've got to bear that in mind. We've got to consider um, all of the facilities, the visible services, the ascension services that the council provide, uh, and, you know, weigh that up with where we are today in terms of the decision we are having to make. Taken into the round with Celtic Edge staff, you know, we have, we were, they did engage with us about 12 months ago when we went out, um, and quite passionately, they are, they are very passionate about their jobs and the service they provide. Um, and, and that's important, isn't it? You know, we've got to make sure that um, the services that we do provide are, are very good and the staff that provide those services for us as well um, are, are happy in their jobs. So, you know, we, we have to take everything into consideration, but also more importantly for me, perhaps, is the financial context. Um, there, I think I've got two questions, just for one, one for who. Um, if we went down the option three route, um, which I think is what's been um, recommended by Eunice and other unions today. The pension costs that have been included, and I don't know if we might need to go into a private for this one, I'm not sure, I, I don't want to talk about the specifics, but would the would the figures that would be included if we went option three who be close to what the maximum is that has been presented to us today? Can I just check before who answers? Mike, that, that doesn't come under the scope of private question, does it? If it provides members with some comfort, if they want to resolve to go into private session where these things can be uh, aired without uh, any difficulty, that is an option. Okay, um, I think maybe it'd be best, because we will need to go into private for other items later, um, just to make sure we are uh, covered on some of the questions. Um, I got it there, haven't I? Okay, oh, prepared for me. Uh, because of the indication from the member who wishes to ask questions on a private appendix, we now need to go into private session. Uh, so I will propose that we move into private session. Uh, can I have a second, uh, please? Obviously, I'll second that. Thank you, Alan. Any abstentions? I don't see any members. If you do not indicate to the contrary by raising your hand, I assume that you are in favour of moving into private. Army. Yes, no indications to the contrary, Leader, and I can confirm that the recording is now being stopped. Uh, the member of the press has just been removed. <clears throat>